Welcome once again into the Radiopedia reading room slash onto the therapy couch for a long overdue hostful episode of the podcast. My name is Andrew Dixon and joining me, he looks all right to me now, but the most recent text message he sent to me was a water pistol emoji firing at an exploding head. It's my co-host, <laughs> Frank Gaylard. Hello, Dixon. It's only water pistol because iPhone doesn't have a real gun. <laughs> doesn't it? I was sitting in my younger son's music gala concert, two hours of five to 11 year olds murdering instruments. <laughs> and the worst thing is because it's all junior school, no one can play. Like it's no. not even that by the end of the night you get some of the senior school kids that are really quite impressive and you know great to listen to. No, no, this is just two hours of torture. And then <laughs> to make it worse, it was running late and they had a raffle and the headmaster started to give this long, and he's the, oh, I'm not sure if I can say this. I can. He's the most boring man in the world. And he gives this long speech thanking everyone, including the cleaners. And the whole room <laughs> is like, we just need to go. It's 8.30 at night. These kids are starting to fall asleep. <laughs> just can we please move on? It was ghastly. And I'd forgotten my headphones. Usually I take headphones and I just listen to a podcast or watch YouTube oh, videos right. until my kid plays. And then, you know, I pop them out and stand up and make sure he sees me because yeah. I genuinely want to see the stuff he does. But uh, anyway, it was awful. I went to a similar one recently and there was a raffle as well. And we didn't know there was a raffle. And the husband and wife next to me, never met them before, but they got they got probably like 20 raffle tickets and they had them all laid out ready for the drawing of the raffle. <laughs> Did they win? And I thought, oh, this is great. You know, we've got a good chance here. So I was like, I'm on, I'm on, I'm looking at it. And we're like, every time they announced, you know, it's red and we'd be like, yes, yes, we've got a red. And then it's 62. Oh, and then all the other tables just started looking at us because we were really getting into it. We'd had a couple of drinks by this stage. <laughs> it sounds much better. I could have done with a couple of drinks. String instruments. Is that right? Uh, it's mostly strings. There was some singing and I don't know. It was a cacophony. It was awful. <laughs> well, if it's string instruments, I've got a bit of a, a little uh, segue here because I would have sounded a bit like a score for a horror movie. And today <laughs> is actually Friday the 13th, it Gaylord, is. as we record it this. Is. And we're fast approaching the scariest time of the year. And I'm not talking about tax time. <laughs> <laughs> Halloween. Halloween, yeah. Uh, yeah we're yeah. gradually having to do Halloween in Australia as well, right? I know. It's become a massive thing. Like, when I was a kid, I don't remember Halloween being a thing at all. No, like it, it was something exist. you occasionally saw in an American movie. Scooby Doo. Right? There was always the Halloween yeah, yeah, yeah. episodes. <laughs> but that's about it. And then maybe like the Treehouse of Horrors Simpson episodes. Yeah. But now the last five or so years in Australia, particularly in these suburbs that we're in in Melbourne, it's become massive. Like my kids would rate it as their number one holiday oh, of really? the year. Yeah, Did yeah. They put it ahead of Christmas. We have carved a pumpkin or two mm -hmm. in our time. Yeah. What about you? We did when, when Natalie and I were in Canada, we pumpkined, but uh, we haven't pumpkined here. I think both of my boys are like, oh, it's gross. I don't want to touch that. <laughs> There's a difference though, I think, between when you look at it in North America and then you look at it here, because my memory of Halloween here is often, you know, you've just finished school and then the kids go out and do it and it's really, really hot. Yeah. So you're starting to get long days. And, and the it, pumpkins rot really, really quickly. <laughs> you've just got sweat coming through your makeup. Yeah. I think it's different to that, you know, cold nighttime kind of atmosphere that you get in the Northern Hemisphere. Anyway, I did, I did mention up top that this is a hostful episode. Yeah. So no main segment, just Frank and I bagging on just like we have been <laughs> randomly until we've had enough or, uh, or you've had enough as a listener. It's been a while since the last one of these, Gaylord, and I wrote a note to myself after mm. it that says, banana peel hot desk. Oh. <laughs> Frank ran out of time to tell this goat. So please ask him oh. on the next hostful. We're going straight out of the gates with a goat. Yeah, yeah. We're really putting people off. <laughs> banana peel hot desk. Maybe it should be called banana peel gate, like all good scandals. Oh, so it's a scandal. At, at work, we have hot desks, meaning you don't have your own desk. You just go to MR reporting and whatever workstation is free, you take it. And I, I know this will surprise you, but I'm fairly neat and fairly obsessive about my work environment, mm -hmm. but many of my colleagues are just dirty. <laughs> I'm not going to mention any names, but 
they know who they are. Candy, you know who you are. (laughs) (laughs) And so I sat down and I put my elbows on the desk and I felt something squishy under, (laughs) under my elbow. I pulled it up and there was part of a banana peel stuck to my elbow. Because someone had left, Candice, uh, a banana on the desk. And it wasn't the banana peel. It was the the stringy. Do you know what the stringy thing is called? The one on the outside of the banana that oh, you have Oh, that to... you sometimes pull off. Uh, no. I couldn't remember what it was called either. So I asked Chat GDP, and this is what it said. The white stringy stuff on bananas is called flo- flowman? Flowman? Mm, flowem. F- flowem bundles? Or phloem strands. These are vascular bundles in the banana fruit that serve to transport nutrients, primarily sugars, from the leaves of the banana plant to the fruit as it develops. Many people prefer to remove these strands before consuming the banana for a smoother eating experience. (laughs) Candace just likes a smooth eating experience. And I look, and I respect. Her smooth eating experience, that if she could not leave her <laughs> phloem strands all over my desk, that would be great. And so at work, I'm like always cleaning the desk and throwing stuff out. And for me, the rule is if it's on the desk, uh, it's just going in the bin. If it's just not a keyboard, <laughs> yeah, a yeah. mouse or something else, and it doesn't matter what it is. But that idea of a workplace that's shared, but not kept really clean, it's kind of gross, right? It disturbs you. Yeah, there's masks and ugh, that was all that that was. This reminds me of two things. So the first one is like a meme. Have you seen that anatomy of a banana meme? <laughs> no. So they have, it's a peeled banana. So it's just the yeah. fruit of the banana. And it, uh, it says anatomy of the banana. And then it points to the main part of the banana and it says fruity goodness or something. And then it points at that little bit at the bottom, you know, the very last little yeah, bit yeah, at the yeah. bottom of the banana. And it, sa- it says Satan's anus. <laughs> <laughs> so true. That so is true. where those uh, flow and bundles come together and they amass in a little Satan's anus at the bottom of your banana. Don't eat that bit. No, I have. Uh, Candace very, wouldn't be eating that bit. No, no. Very mixed feelings about uh, bananas. They, they're good for about one hour. They <laughs> yeah. go from being too green to being okay between like 2.30 and 3.30 p.m. on Thursday. And then they're just brown and gross. Yeah. And then it's time to turn them into banana bread. The other thing this reminded me of is I used to have a colleague at work who would always bring his his food along and he'd put it next to his desk. We have hot desks as well. Mm. And he'd put it there and he'd often have like an orange or something or an apple, right? And we just had a running joke where as soon as he left the room, (laughs) we'd get out a pen (laughs) and we'd just draw on the peel of his uh, his apple (laughs) or his... Or his orange. And it was always, I don't know how a nice way to put it, it was always uh, a representation of male genitalia that we put on there. Very mature. Excellent. (laughs) Without fail, as soon as he left the room. (laughs) (laughs) It's how you show people that you care. That's right. He no longer works for us. I don't know why. (laughs) Amazing. (laughs) All right. So I can tick banana peel hot desk off my list. It's good to have those those follow-up items removed from the list. Now, in addition to further Gaylard goats, other things coming up in this hostful uh, episode are Journal Club, yes. letters and feedback. Uh, I've brought along another cognitive bias oh, for good. us to discuss. And, of course, everyone's favourite segment, What You Up To? <laughs> and don't forget, meat update. Always oh, meat update. Yes. Sorry, how could I forget your meat fetish, Gaylord? <laughs> but before we get into that, actually, I'm just looking at your video there, at your background, Gaylord. Nice mm. looking room, artworks on the wall. Did you see that research earlier in the week about Zoom backgrounds and what no. makes you look more trustworthy? No. I mean, I can think of many ways that you could look untrustworthy. (laughs) Yeah. Like the animated I'm on a beach kind of background would not probably make you look very trustworthy, would be my guess. So this was published in PLOS One. Mm -hmm. And so they looked at first impressions made in a Zoom meeting based purely on visuals. And they measured perceived trust and competence. They confirmed, not surprisingly, that if you smile people tend to trust you more. Okay, so smile. And that people trust women more than men. So Also seems very reasonable. (laughs) It seems very reasonable. (laughs) But what do you think they found about video backgrounds, Gaylord? I'll give you some options. Uh, So which background do you think makes you come across more trustworthy and competent? 
So a blank wall, your home, like your living room, your home, your living room, but blurred, a bookshelf, indoor plants, or one of those novelty virtual backgrounds. That so the, the bookshelf and indoor plants, are they virtual backgrounds or are they real? Well, in the study, they're all kind of like superimposing things over to make it, but it, it was implying that it was a real world behind you. So I would think that whenever you are not showing what's behind you, it reduces your trustworthiness because you are hiding things. Mm -hmm. So blurring or putting a virtual background, it's like, I don't know where you are. You could be doing anything. Who knows? You could have, uh, you know, a torture chamber behind you or something. So I would think a real background is better. And then of the options of what to show in the real background, your unmade bed is probably not a good option. <laughs> I would think like a, a nice bookshelf or something would be the most trustworthy thing. So real and serious like the sort of thing that you see lawyers having behind their desk kind of what they found they so they found that bookshelf and indoor plants were by far and away the best things to have in the background so if you want to maximize it gaylord you should have uh, firstly smile be female and sit in front of a bookshelf with some plants on it i reckon it's just showing that you've got your shit together if you can keep a plant alive <laughs> anyone can keep children alive because they complain until you feed them. But yeah. plants, they just, they don't say anything. They just yeah, sit there true. and then you go, oh, that plant died. <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly, the living kind of area, the living room background, so showing your home in the background, that was actually not very good. Hmm. But if you blurred it, it was better. I wonder whether you've got like a soft focus there. So I wonder whether that achieves that same thing. Yeah, like a depth of field thing. And the one that was obviously not so good was that virtual background. Not very trustworthy when you've got, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge sitting behind you. Anyway, I thought that was interesting. Mm. So that seems to be what you kind of see these days is people with a few books and some plants sitting behind them. And it seems to, to carry through in the research. All right, so that was a journal article, Gaylord, but it doesn't count as journal club because I actually delegated that topic to you for this episode. So have you brought something along to share with us? Well, I did. You shared uh, with me one of Lee Al-Halali's latest tutorials. Or... Oh, I see. You're saying I delegated this task to you and then you just found something that I shared with you anyway. No, 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 no. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> So are they still tweetorials or are they ex oil Zorials? Oh, okay. <laughs> Zorials. I don't know. Zorials. Anyway, um, she did one, uh, as usual, very good, uh, on an AJNR article on Chiari 1 malformations, uh, which, you know, at the risk of asking for further all caps shouted emails by the Chiarians, <laughs> uh, I thought I'd, I'd bring that to class and uh, show and share. Yeah, uh, nice this one. particular. It's from the September issue of AJNR and is by Aladdin Ibrahimi and colleagues, primarily at the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland, in the US. And Bethesda is, of course, best known for uh, being the founding place of Bethesda Softworks, the company that has brought us Fallout and Skyrim and <laughs> Starfield and is therefore single-handedly responsible for more wasted human hours than any other company, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, this study is a prospective longitudinal study of patients with Chiari 1 malformation, which they shorten in the paper to CMI, which is Chiari malformation type 1, written in Roman numerals, which is an I, so it's CMI. It's, I don't understand, now that journals are all online and they don't have to yeah. really worry about print, why we have to have these ridiculous acts. Anyway, that's another go. Yeah. Uh, anyway. So chronic myocardial infarct. Yep, continue. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and these patients were uh, with and without syringomyelia, and they were treated with posterior fossa decompression and duroplasty. They looked at what the morphological changes of the posterior fossa and craniosurvical junction were following treatment, as well as change in symptoms. And they recruited 38 patients and they all had a baseline MRI and then six follow-up studies at three months and then yearly up to five years, hmm. which sounds pretty impressive, except yeah. uh, only 14 of them actually did the full five years. But it didn't seem to matter so much because things didn't change so much after the first couple. And the surgery they had, they all had a suboccipital craniectomy, 
and they all had a C1 laminectomy, which is pretty standard. And some of them also had the top of C2 lamina nibbled away if they needed to expose the tonsils all the way down. Mm-hmm. And they all had an a duroplasty with pericranium. And, and I think from speaking to our surgeons, the duroplasty is really important because just doing a posterior fossa decompression without enlarging the dura doesn't achieve much because the dura is really thick uh-huh. down there. And so you're not actually changing the shape uh, very much of the CSF space around the tonsils. But they didn't go any deeper than that. So they didn't resect the tonsils. They didn't open up the fourth ventricle or do any subarachnoid dissection at all. Mm -hmm. And then they measured stuff. And when I say measured stuff, they they measured a lot. They went to town. They went to town. And, I mean, we should have a look at the the paper where they have all the different things they, they measured. Because you know that meme of the guy who's got the conspiracy theory on the wall with lots oh, yeah, of cutouts yeah. and all the red string yeah, and he's yeah. like waving frantically? This is what this <laughs> chart looks like. They measured height and distances and areas and widths and all sorts of things. It's interesting but- though, just before you continue on, when you do this kind of thing, you really need to come up with all these measurements before you do the study. It's really yes. important because you're you're measuring multiple variables, right? And then if you just come up with them afterwards and look for which one correlates, one of them's going to hit, you know, if you're just using a p-value of 0.05, like you've got a yeah. one in 20 chance. That's right. And so if you're measuring 20 things, one of them's going to randomly go, oh my gosh, this is the key factor. You know, yeah. you can't really do this stuff afterwards. You need to have defined everything you're going to measure before you start. And there has to be plausibility, Absolutely. You can't just yeah. measure, like, for example, if you measured renal hilum width as well as pancreatic tail length or something in Chiari <laughs> patients, it's like, well, <laughs> there has to be some plausibility. So, and in here, all of them are kind of posterior fossa measurements. But I think the thing that is interesting about this is they found lots of things to measure, not just tonsillar descent. I think it is useful to keep in mind that we sometimes get. Uh, focused on a particular thing when it comes to labeling or diagnosing something. Mm -hmm. And with Chiari, uh, I think it's easy to think of Chiari 1 malformations as being due to tonsillar descent, because that's the thing that we measure. But in fact, uh, and this is what they point out, Chiari 1 is really about CSF dynamic Mm. disruption around the craniocervical uh, junction or foramen magnum, and that tonsillar descent is something you can measure as a surrogate of that. And so what they found is uh, that, in fact, looking at the CSF behind the cervical medullary junction is a good sort of measure. Uh, and the glib summary of their findings is that if you hack out a whole bunch of stuff behind the cerebellar tonsils and enlarge the dura, Now, wait for it, because this finding will really surprise you. (laughs) The amount of CSF behind the tonsils increases and it remains bigger later on, because I guess, you know, surprisingly, the bone doesn't grow back or or something. Anyway. Phenomenal. And that doing so improves the symptoms and and size of the syrinx. So an uncharitable sort of interpretation is this, uh, well, duh, what did you expect? You know, this is why we do this operation. But actually... I think it is good that we are doing prospective studies to reproduce and validate treatments that we're doing Mm -hmm. and to check that what we're doing actually works. And maybe this is an argument for not fiddling with the tonsils, like if this is good enough to just do the duroplasty. There is one thing which I think is really important in here is that the reduction in pain and improved quality of life correlated with CSF morphometrics, which is suggesting that there's a dose response. If everybody improved in terms of pain and quality of life, irrespective of how much extra CSF you allowed in that area, Mm. you'd be like, "Mm, maybe there's a bit of a placebo effect going on here. Um, Any surgery will help. doesn't matter how dramatic it is. But the fact that there is this suggestion of a dose response, you know, adds to to the weight that, yes, it is all about CSF flow dynamics and the more space you give it around that area, the better. And I think from a reporting Chiari 1 studies pre-treatment, it's important to not just measure the tonsils, but also have a look. And I find looking at it on axial imaging most helpful to just see exactly how much CSF there is around 
that frame and magnum kind of area. And I often use the term, um, the cervical medullary junction is embraced by the tonsils or something oh, like yeah, that yeah, yeah. to really sort of emphasize that there's no good CSF space around it. Because you could imagine that you could have low lying tonsils, but if there was a ton of room around it, it, it wouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, you could have not very low lying tonsils, but no CSF and still have a problem. But interestingly, this study really did show that if you're less than two millimeters down, you don't have any problem. And if you're more than five millimeters down, you kind of do. And mm. so then the question is, what do you do with those intermediate numbers? I don't know. Do you have a, a hard and fast rule? Are you a five millimeter guy or? No. When I was reading Lee's tweetorial, she talks about the the pointed tonsillar morphology. You often look at that on the coronal mm. images. And she was making the point that, you know, if you reduce your posterior fossa size and you start to push your tonsils out through the frame of magnum, they become pointed. That's just yeah. what happens. It's not the fact that the pointing means that it's a Chiari 1 versus the rounded means that it's just some tonsillar ectopia that's normal. I think it's important to separate out things that occur because of an underlying process. In this case, CSF disruption and crowding at frame and magnum versus thinking of them as independent markers. And an example of that in a different condition would be normal pressure hydrocephalus and all the different measurements that people talk about, you know, the colossal angle narrowing and the disproportionate mm -hmm. enlargement of the Sylvian cisterns. And uh, they're the main ones, I guess, but they both just represent this upward shift of brain towards the vertex, right? And you can measure that at the colossal angle. You can say that the sulci are crowded at the top and widened laterally, but it's all part of the same thing. And here, the fact that there's not enough room for the tonsils and that they're wedged down in frame and magnum is all the, the pathology. And you can measure how far down they are, or you can look at the shape of them, or you can look at how much CSF there is. They're all different manifestations of the same disease. And when you're interpreting these images, you should keep that in mind and not just measure one thing and then move on and call it irrespective of that. Also, because if you just measure, you might actually be missing or misinterpreting Chiari 1 for a acquired tonsillar ectopia due to hypotension or some other mm. process. Anyway, that was my journal club. Very well done. Should we move on Let's. to cognitive biases? So in previous episodes, we've covered uh, alliterative bias and availability bias. So if you haven't heard those, go back and listen to past hostful episodes for those. But today, I thought, Gaylard, we'd branch away from the letter A, okay. and we're going to do the need for closure bias. Oh. So this isn't actually in the Radiopedia article, not yet anyway, but I found a well-written list of cognitive biases, much longer than our Radiopedia article, that were written for medicine in general, primarily physicians, I think, by Pat Krosky, MD, from Dalhousie University. And the need for closure bias was one from there. And I actually think it applies quite a bit to radiology. Do you want to have a go at guessing what this bias is? I haven't heard of this one before, but I'd be guessing that it is the need to tie everything nicely together in an explanation that makes sense. So that if you're seeing a bunch of different findings, you really just want to come up with an explanation that seems to satisfy you in the way that in a movie, like you, you need closure yeah, yeah, yeah. in a movie, you don't want lots of loose ends. It, it all sort of has to make sense. Yeah. And I think it's, it's the pressure to do that. It's that yeah. you feel that your job is to actually come to a definitive um, okay. call. So I'll read out what Pat, has written. So he said, need for closure, the bias towards drawing a conclusion or making a verdict about something when it is still not definite. It occurs in the context of making a diagnosis where the clinician may feel obliged to make a specific diagnosis under conditions of time or social pressure or to escape feelings of doubt or uncertainty. Mm. It might be preferable to say instead that the patient's complaint is not yet diagnosed. So I think that relates to radiology a lot because I think we see ourselves as the person who makes the call, right? Mm. The imaging happens, we give people the answer. Often, you know, the clinicians will come in and be looking at a study with you and they're like, oh, do you think this is this or that? In your mind, there is a bit of a, mm, yeah, I'm not sure whether that's a laceration or a normal fold yeah. in the spleen. And then you make a call, right? You go, no, I think it's a laceration. Okay. Yep. 
and you call it as a laceration. But really that bias to to be the person who makes the definitive assessment, uh, I think it's an interesting one. I've got two two comments on that. One is I think it applies to pathologists much more than it applies to us because you almost never read a histology report which says, yeah, I don't know, it could be these things, right? There's always a final diagnosis. And then when you go to an MDM or speak to the pathologist, it's much more nuanced and much less clear. Or you sometimes get a pathologist calling you and saying, hey, you know, what's your differential on this? Because this things look weird. It could be a bunch of stuff. And you have that nuanced conversation with them. And then you read the report and it just says, oh, it's final diagnosis, condition X. And it's like, oh, okay, now you're certain. So I think radiologists have that, but I think pathologists have it more. The other problem with doing this is that once you make a diagnosis, clinicians love it because it makes their job easy, but it's really hard to back it away. Once Mm. you call it a microadenoma, good luck trying to undo that diagnosis. You can say that the pituitary looks completely normal as many times as you want. That patient is still getting a yearly scan for the rest of their life, pretty much. Whereas if you give room for backing away from a diagnosis by saying, yeah, you know, could be repeat imaging or whatever, I think you're doing not only not as much harm, but you're reducing the number of follow-up examinations that you you need to do, not, not to mention all these poor patients that can't get health insurance because they've got a prior diagnosis of, you know, pituitary cancer. <laughs> I see it often in radiology in, in trainees, you know, they've been on overnight and then you're reviewing their scans that they've reported and you see that they've said very certain diagnosis, there's mm. this, right? And then you're co-reading it and they go, oh yeah, that one. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether it was this or this. Yeah, um, I went right. with this. They're telling you unofficially, I had no idea. I thought it was maybe this or this. But I took a punt. (laughs) But their report in the middle of the night that the clinicians are going to act on very much just went for one thing and ignored entirely the other option. It's, It's an interesting bias. And I think that we feel some kind of responsibility to put something definitive But then the opposite is we also don't want to hedge, right? Because we get criticized. Well, that's the thing. We do get criticized for always hedging. Could be cancer, could be infection, could be iatrogenic, who knows, and get another scan. That's kind of the way that we're portrayed sometimes. I guess with experience, you get to the point where you can be certain when you can be certain, but you have to be willing to be uncertain. And I think it's easier to say, I don't know what this is when you've proven yourself and you have the respect of your clinicians Mm. than when you're junior and knowing what it is seems to be a surrogate for how good you are. And I think that's where registrars overextend their certainty because saying, I don't know, seems like showing weakness or ignorance. Yeah. If you are uncertain during the whole process of reviewing a scan and at the end, you still haven't come to a certainty that needs to be reflected in your report somewhere. And uh, I think you do create a lot of harm by being overly certain in the same way that I think you create harm by being too hedgy because it stops people being able to treat patients if you never come up with a diagnosis. Anyway, need for closure. I think I need for closure on cognitive biases. (laughs) Well, there is one from Pat, which is called the multiple alternatives bias, which is that giving too many differential (laughs) diagnoses. So, you know. Are these all biases or are these just things that happen. Well, that's what they are. Cognitive biases are just things that happen. We <laughs> deceive ourselves a little. Should we move on to maybe your meet update? Do you want to do that? Very, very brief one. Okay. It's This is uh, an intersection of meet and AI, and oh. it falls into the what could possibly go wrong category of research. <laughs> the uh, Kilcoy Pastoral Company here in Australia is training an AI-driven circular saw carcass cutting robot. (laughs) Because, you know, we've already taught AI to beat humans at uh, strategic games like StarCraft and first-person shooters. And uh, we have robots that can run and carry things, maybe guns. And now we're also teaching them how to use chainsaws and how to cut bones just right. And these this robot specifically is where it soars through the spine and the ribs of beef carcasses, which mm. is called scribing, mm. beef scribing. And uh, with an angle grinder on a robotic arm, it looks exactly 
out of a horror movie of some kind. And how do you train it? Do you show humans doing that task or how's, how's it didn't go into the like the training process but the, i think the biggest task is that all carcasses are differently shaped mm. yeah and they're hanging slightly differently and so it's it's presumably mostly image recognition and working out the path for the robot arm to go and chop it into bits and it specifically chops the bones without cutting the meat so it's kind of the preparing the carcass for them oh, okay, for the yeah, yeah. butchery. Yeah. And it's apparently quite dangerous because you've got a circular saw I and bits of bone. So. And I think there is a, a a plot for a movie based on this, I think, though. The Kilcoy robot. <laughs> you circular saws. I actually have a bit of a, a meat update as well, just because I think last episode – I mentioned very quickly that there was some research going on about adding a seaweed to the feed of cows and Mm -hmm. to try and reduce the amount of methane produced. Mm -hmm. I just said it as a little side comment. And that's been in the news again recently. So there's this Australian guy called Sam Elsom, who's an interesting character. He is actually, I think he was a model and a fashion designer, like a green kind of fashion uh, label. Mm. And then he kind of pivoted. He heard this story about this seaweed that had been shown in research to reduce methane production in cows. And he basically set up a company and decided, can we commercially grow this seaweed? It's called asparagopsis. Your beef doesn't end up tasting like fish, does it? No. Well, they've done research and the actual meat that's produced and the health of the cows seems to be maintained. There seems to be no real side effects that come from this, Mm -hmm. except for a 30 to 40% reduction in methane. And methane is interesting, actually, from from a global warming, from a greenhouse effect point of view, because did you know it's 80 times stronger as a greenhouse gas than CO2? Is. Well, I didn't know it was that much, but yes, I, I knew that. It's interesting. It's over like a 20-year period, but over a 100-year time frame, it's only 28 times worse than CO2 okay. is because it, it kind breaks of naturally down. breaks down. Yeah. So, the, you know, the CO2 we put in the atmosphere now is going to be around for hundreds of years as opposed yep. to the methane, which is, you know, kind of a 10 to 20-year period. But it is certainly worth reducing as much methane as we can. His problem that he's running to, he has cracked it. He's worked out how to make this seaweed, how to get it into the feed of the cattle. He's measured that the the methane is reduced. He's in the running for a prize from Prince William for for, (laughs) a green kind of thing. But he is struggling to get farmers to add it to the feed because the cost is a dollar per head per day to essentially get this extract added in. And there's no equivalent to like a carbon credit that yeah. you can tap into. So yeah. if there was, if you know, if farmers were charged a certain amount per cow, um, if they didn't have this feed, yeah. then suddenly they would add it in. But because there's no incentive for, or you them, could fit each cow with a, a methane meter at the tail end, <laughs> and uh, you know you have to pay a levy on uh, on the yeah. methane. I've got a friend who works in the startup sort of space and um, I had a conversation with him which was interesting because he does this round of um, pitches where people come and and tell him their idea for a a million dollar company and they have to decide on whether to fund it or not. And he says that every single year someone comes up with a way of recycling used car tyres into some way. And his point was the idea isn't the hard thing. This is a recurrent solved problem, what you to do with car tires. The trick is how do you make a company that's viable? Yeah. That's the hard thing. In many ways, the idea thing is the the simple first step, but creating a, a company that works based around that idea is way harder. It is disconcerting that he really, in order to get this idea through and to get this, you know, seaweed into the feed of cattle, it's really going to take something from a legislation point of view, yeah. a carbon credits point of view, in order to drive the change. And it's something that, you know, it's it seems like a no-brainer, right? You know, if we can reduce methane yeah. and not have any uh, adverse effects, then then why, why can't we do it? And if you can, you know, produce this seaweed commercially, he's already shown the ability to do that. He's got 1.5 million doses of this stuff ready to go. Just no one wants to. No one it. is willing to buy it. 
Um, so Maybe I could get some so. of these doses for my son. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad idea. He needs to think laterally. But I mean, these externalities, um, these externalities need legislation largely to solve it. It's like polluting river water or something if you're a factory. Um, yeah. No one is going to do that unless there's a incentive put in place. And yeah. A dollar a head, considering how small the margins are for farmers and how hard yeah. it is to make a profit in that industry as it is. It's these externalized costs that they can yeah. just they can just hide and they they avoid them. But it just it needs to be they need to be accountable for the methane that they're producing, and there needs to be a cost for that. And then there needs to be a, this solution to to help solve. Or it. we can just grow all our meat in vats, collect the methane so that we can power Starship to send humans to Mars. The reality is that we need all of these things, right? We yeah. need everything we can do to reduce you know, CO2, everything we can do to reduce methane, plus we want to, you know, develop lab-grown meat to avoid, you know, the slaughtering of animals. So all these things need to happen. It's not just one or the other. It's everything needs to kind of come together. Yep. All right, let's move on to letters and questions, Gaylard. Oh, excellent. Yes. Firstly, just in general, mm -hmm. lots of positive feedback about our recent forensic radiology and veterinary radiology episodes. Mm -hmm. So it seems like our non-clinical episodes are the ones that really trigger people to write emails to us. Yep. But it's the clinical episodes like, you know, paraganglioma and the pituitary MRI readful that actually get more listens um, ah, from people interesting. when you look at the analytics. So hopefully we're finding a nice balance between those clinical episodes to give people some education and information um, and those interesting non-clinical ones to kind of keep people and what about these hostfuls does anyone listen or write about these <laughs> uh, i'm going to ignore that question mate <laughs> these are just for us no no i think the true fans mate the true fans are the That's ones right. so if you're listening to this point in this hostful you are a true fan and we appreciate you <laughs> so i've got a letter here from uh from tom and he writes Long time listener, first time caller, which I don't believe because I don't. I'm not sure after less than twelve months we can have a long time listener. But anyway, <laughs> uh, he says I'm a psychiatrist, so there's only one organ that I have a passing interest in, but I still find the topics and commentary on your podcast very entertaining. In line with one of my favourite topics on your podcast, I'd like to ask, what is your favourite cocktail name? And he says, personally, I can't go past the Corpse Reviver number two. <laughs> And as the legend Harry Craddock said, four of these taken in swift succession will unrevive the corpse again. <laughs> and he says, keep up the good work, Tom. Now, before you tell us your favourite cocktail name, Gaylard, uh, in mm -hmm. case anyone's wondering, I'll go through the ingredients of the Corpse Reviver number two. Mm -hmm. uh, so it features gin, Lilit Blanc, a French aperitif, orange liqueur, and fresh lemon juice. Sounds quite tasty. Mm. But these are used in equal parts and then it's shaken with ice and served in a glass that's been rinsed with absinthe. Which is now no longer toxic and containing lead and illegal. It went out of favour for a while, did it? It, it, had was, lead in uh, it? it was made illegal in France, I think, for ages because I think it was lead. There were people just going crazy because of it. It was like a lower class drink and yeah. consumed... In, I think it was in France what gin was in London, homemade, terrible quality, a yeah, lot yeah. of it, uh, lots of social ills associated with it. But now I don't particularly like absinthe. It's a real, ugh, you, you do not wake up well the next day. Yeah, I can only remember, and I don't think I had it, but I think other people did. After finishing medical school, a whole bunch of us, like probably... 30 or 40 of us all went up to the Wet Sunday Islands in Queensland in Australia on the you know Great Barrier Reef and we did a sailing trip, right? So we had like four or five yachts and there were like eight of us on each yacht. And the night before we set sail, right, we were all in one place and we hit the town and then absinthe <laughs> came out oh, and all these people were having absinthe. And the next day we needed to try and convince these yacht hiring company that we were safe and responsible and that we were gonna <laughs> we were gonna treat their yachts properly. And people were looking oh, they were looking terrible. <laughs> I, I must say it was the best holiday I've ever been on. Right. Because it's just, you know, with a whole bunch of mates and then sailing around the wet Sunday that Islands. It was great. amazing. Anyway. 
Well, so you're talking about favorite cocktail names. I see you've yes, uh, yes, you've given it. me some to choose from here. But yeah, these I just are all... googled it and wrote down some of the ones that they had. Do you want me yeah. to read some? Yeah, oh, you can if you want. Yeah, they're a bit lame, aren't they? Between the sheets, fuzzy navel, duck fart, <laughs> buttery nipple, slippery nipple. Porn star martini sex These on the beach. These sound like the band names that, uh, you know, school kids, when they create their first band and they might get yes. to play as a warm-up yeah, yeah, at yeah. the local pub. <laughs> no, my, <laughs> my personal favourite is probably the Winston Churchill just because it's classy and it's got a nice story, which is yeah, the story. Yeah. when Winston Churchill was asked how much vermouth he likes in his martini. He said he likes to pour gin over ice into a chilled glass while glancing in the direction of France. And that was how much vermouth, in other words, none. (laughs) So if you ask for a Winston Churchill, you just get cold gin. (laughs) Another one named after a person that I really like is the Charlie Chaplin. Well, what's that? I don't know the Charlie Chaplin. It's a nice cocktail. Oh, I'd have to look it up. Let me quickly look it up. Oops. (laughs) You've got to write cocktail. If you just type in Charlie Chaplin. It doesn't work. Goes, surprise, surprise. It shows you some dude with a moustache and a hat. <laughs> yeah, so Charlie Chaplin is one and a half parts slow gin, one part freshly squeezed lime juice, three quarters parts apricot brandy, oh. and a quarter part simple syrup. Really, really tasty. I love mm, it. So it's got good. a nice, nice kind of sour cocktail. Another letter. So this one's from CERN. And they say, not CERN as in the Large Hadron Collider. Oh, damn. I was getting Sorry. excited there. Yeah. No, this is. Actually, it is. Yeah. And they're asking <laughs> about subatomic particles and what our <laughs> thoughts are. Actually, speaking of subatomic particles, there was a news story about the antimatter. Did you see that? No. So there are some theories that antimatter should behave the opposite in mm-hmm. gravity to matter. Oh, in gravity as well. Yeah, so it should, so that antimatter, if you create antimatter, it should potentially fall upwards and therefore that would prove the presence of anti-gravity. So anyway, they did this experiment recently, Mm -hmm. which actually showed, no, that antimatter also behaves the same. So they kind of create it and then let it move and saw that it went down rather than up. Oh, boo. That's disappointing. So if you were hanging out for anti-gravity or the opposite of hanging out, floating up for anti-gravity, then you're... uh, should be disappointed. But this is not CERN giving us a new no, anti-gravity no. <laughs> This is another person named CERN. And they say, hi, guys. Absolutely love your podcast. Amazing, funny, engaging, and relatable, except when you talk about subatomic particles. <laughs> I love listening on the drive to and from work. I'm a fifth-year radiology registrar looking at the next stage of my career and would love some early consultant slash fellowship advice, things like managing contract negotiations, private versus public work, and workload in general. Thank you, exclamation mark. Hmm. Now, this very much sounds like a future episode of the podcast or Mm. even maybe like a day five session at Radiopedia 2024. What do you think, Frank? Mm. I think a lot of people want that kind of advice. I'm not sure how much advice I've got to give. That was my worry as well. But I think we need to we need to bring in other people for this. Yeah. And it'd be good also to have not just Australian perspective, but yeah. US, UK, things like that, so that we can kind of, because I, I suspect we'd have a lot of trainees listening to the podcast and that would be very relevant to them. So maybe uh, we can work on that. It may take a little while. You know, by the time we release that episode soon, you'll be probably the director of a department or something, but we will get to it <laughs> eventually. <laughs> uh, now, our final letter here from uh, Jay, a radiologist in Lafayette, Louisiana. He says, hi, I really enjoy the content on the podcast and, of course, the website and the conference. It would be really fantastic if the U.S. entities would recognize your awesome CME, and you put that in all caps, awesome oh, CME. Oh, wow. I like a shouted awesome. And allow Radiopedia credits to count towards our CME requirements. Thanks for all the good work and stay rad. Well, funny you should mention this, Dixon. It's Jay who mentioned Because it. after, uh, Jay, uh, after about three or four years, Radiopedia is finally CME accredited in the U.S., but before you get too excited, it's it's not as easy as just flicking a switch and then everything you do on Radiopedia counts. What we are starting with is starting to give CME points, and this is AMA, PRA, Category 1 credits, accredited through the ACCME in the United States for some of our new courses and for our next conference. And then gradually we will be revising and re issuing our courses with CME points 
And eventually the plan is to also have CME points for browsing the website and doing cases and even the podcast, but that will take time. So stay tuned. I think next month we're hopefully launching our first two courses with proper CME points. Very exciting. Yep, very, very long exciting. time coming, an enormous amount of work. So Jay and any other radiologists in the United States, please do spread the word that CME credits are coming to Radiopedia. Now would be a great time for you to get groups together, uh, get your department together and maybe apply for bulk all access passes to, yes, the, uh, nice, to the website. Nice pitch, Dixon. <laughs> <laughs> smooth, 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 smooth. All right, let's do our final little segment here, Gaylord. It's called... What you up to? Do you want to start off or should I? Well, I hopefully haven't spoken about this on the podcast before, but I have got a resin 3D printer. Have I have I talked about this? No, you haven't. So under the guise of my eldest son's birthday, I managed to smuggle in a 3D printer into the house. Because, you know, in our family, we're extremely sporty and jockey and uh, oh, yeah. There, yeah. there's no tabletop gaming or Dungeons and Dragons ever or any science fiction <laughs> or anything. No sarcasm either. So my oldest son has started doing a campaign of Dungeons and Dragons with his friends and he wants miniatures. And so I thought magnanimously that we could get a printer and then <laughs> he gives me commissions and I sit there, we listen to audio books and paint tiny little miniatures and it's so much fun and it's so cheap and easy now like two years ago i looked into it and it was to get a reasonable not great 3d printer for resin was about 800 Mm dollars, and now you get ones that are easily the quality of what you get pre-printed the ones that you pay for for like a couple of hundred bucks and it's as easy as plugging a USB stick with a file into it and pushing print and it just comes out. It's great. And what about the actual cost of materials? Like, this is the oh, thing with printers right. as well, right? You buy a printer, the printer was cheap, but then you're up for ink costs ongoing. Yeah, no, so it's not nowhere near like that because um, depending on the kind of resin you get, it, it does depend, but it's about 20 to $50 a kilogram of resin mm-hmm. and uh, each miniature takes maybe five grams. So you're talking cents per miniature. Mm-hmm. And in terms of buying the models, there's a site called myminifactory.com, which is kind of the go-to place for miniatures, even though the search functionality is just abysmal. But uh, you pay a couple of dollars per file and then you can yep. print it as many times as you want. And if you botch it or break it or something, you can always just print it again. So what you're saying, Gaylard, is that you are ready to mass produce three-dimensional merchandise for the podcast. Oh, we should to have uh, it to Dixon the action figurines. <laughs> <laughs> Posable. <laughs> I reckon if we got if we got Skalski involved, he could probably make a 3D model of us. And then <laughs> if you get your printer going, do you have to then you have to then hand paint them, do you? Yeah, that's that's the time Ooh, consuming part. These could be quite expensive. Yeah. Collectors items. Anyway, let's put a pin in this. What about you, Dixon? What have you been up to? <laughs> well, nothing as exciting as that. Although I did I did mention a couple of episodes ago that we recently put our sixteen uh, year old or almost sixteen year old golden retriever down and we didn't plan to get another dog not for a while i was kind of hoping to go a little while of experiencing Mm. not having to think about what do i do with this dog when i go on holidays all those kind of things but what my family's saying it was fate because we got this message from one of my my wife's friends uh, just a randomly message to a group chat and it said is anyone in the market for golden retriever puppies we've just had a litter (laughs) and we calculated the date of birth of this little puppy yeah. And it was the day before we put our prior dog down. Oh. And the kids were like, this is it. This has got to happen. Anyway, so we've got... It was meant to be. Lying at my feet right now is a nine-week-old golden retriever puppy. And she's uh, been a delight, but um, a lot of work. And for some reason, uh, I put in my leave forms for, for leave at work, right? Mm. And I missed October. And the end oh. of September, like I just missed it. So off. you actually have to work like a normal person. So I've been working five. Can you believe this, Gaylord? Five full time weeks in a row at the hospital plus a puppy. So 
I've mm-hmm. just been really busy and no Radiopedia stuff or podcast stuff has been possible. And we've just had yeah. our first Radiopedia 2024 co-convener meeting and I turned up thoroughly unprepared. But um, the conference is going to go ahead. Yes. Uh, everything's everything's going to come together. Uh, we're about to start to invite our speakers and work out the, the workshops and things like that. Anyway, we should wrap up this hostful episode, Gaylard. How can people get in contact with us? Well, we're at Radiopedia on Twitter and Instagram, as well as at Frank Gaylard and at Dr. Andrew Dixon. And you can, of course, email us at podcast at radiopedia.org with any ideas and or feedback that you might have. Mm-hmm. Yes, let us know what kind of things you want 3D printed, what kind of merch, <laughs> and how much or how little you'd be willing to pay for it. <laughs> we need to find a 3D printed meat AI crossover (laughs) (laughs) and if you want to help support radiopedia then you can become a paid supporter via the website or purchase an all access pass to our online courses and conferences which soon will come with ama cme credits in doing so you'll be helping us to give free conference access and course access to people in 125 low and middle income countries and 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 of course what else can can people do to help us out gaylord you can help us out by leaving a five star no less five star review in the podcast app of your choosing i think we've gone past 155 star reviews on spotify game oh, nice. with an average rating of five. 5.0 stars yeah oh, amazing you know if it you works. ask people to, yeah, yeah, <laughs> just ask people and they will do it all right now <laughs> next episode in a couple of weeks i have a readful Gaylar, oh, um, so a trauma and emergency radiologist will be joining me. Mm-hmm. I think you know who he is. Uh, so looking forward to recording that very soon and then sharing it with you. But in the meantime, uh, I better read this last little line, which is, and we'll catch you all again sometime soon in the reading room. Stay rad, everyone. Stay rad and uh, stay safe. Stay safe. <laughs> There's a <laughs> lot of safeness that's required these days. Stay safe. And yes, stay we skillfully right. avoided the Israel Palestine issue. So, yes, stay safe, and I hope everyone yeah, is doing well it's out there. Safe. Thanks. Thanks for the downer, Gayla. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can play an excerpt from your leg cramp oh, okay. as an outro. <laughs> I'll do that. I'll do that. All right. See you, everyone. Bye. See you Bye-bye. in a couple of weeks. I've got a cramp in my leg. Sorry. <laughs> oh, I just was in a strange position. Oh, we'll keep this in. Oh, yeah, I'm just rubbing it out now. <laughs> this could be a sealed section at the end. This is uh... <laughs> oh, this is for, for people who kept on listening a, after the music fade. A hostful extra special. Oh, my gosh. How bad are cramps? They are I the worst. Them. Like I thought, can you continue talking through a cramp? No. And for a split second, I thought maybe I could, but no. No, no. cramps are. And then once you have one, it's going to keep coming back, isn't it? Anyway. <laughs> All right. I need to have a banana. Yes, lots uh, of potassium. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Good callback. All right. See you, everyone. That was a bonus bit. <laughs>